Hello beautiful people, welcome back to the channel. Pots and Petals here, everything garden and allotment related. It's Saturday morning and it's not even eight o'clock yet. I mean, that sunshine was shining in my bedroom this morning. So I thought, come on, let's get up and get down onto the plot. I mean, I'm not gonna be here for very long today. I'll probably be here till just after lunchtime. So I wanna try and get as many jobs done as possible. Now, the main job that I wanted to get done today was plant out some of my asparagus crowns because they arrived in the post this week. However, I seem to have left them at home so I'm going to be back down here tomorrow and I'll take you through how to plant them some top tips because if we really look after these plants then we can get them to last up to 20 years and I absolutely love asparagus and they're quite pricey if you buy them in the shop so yes keep an eye out for that video tomorrow but for today we have got plenty of jobs that I really need to get on with so if you remember I said last weekend I must sow some seeds out into the main bed so we've got some beetroot we've got some spring onions some carrots and I'm pretty sure there's going to be some more seeds in there as well so we'll get some of those direct sown into some of the beds and then in the poly house we have got loads of plants that are ready to be potted up so we've got some roses we've got rosemary uh, we've got some red currant plants and i've also got some melons that i've started from seed back at home so i want to get them into their own little pots because they're starting to look a little bit yellow and they're getting quite big to the point where they're putting their little feelers up and they're wanting to sort of grow up something so we'll sort those out a little bit later on as well now because those brassicas are also starting to get quite big i need to start thinking about where i'm going to put them and start building building the brassica frame. Now I haven't got the butterfly netting with me just yet, but I do want to put the frame up just so I know exactly where I'm going to be popping those. So that's another job we can tick off the list. I've also brought a few more plants. So as you know, I can't start my peppers, my chilies, cucumbers and things like that at home because I just don't have the space for them. So I did have to go out and I've bought a few. So I'll take you through some of the peppers and the cukes and stuff that I brought yesterday and I will be taking them home because this week it does look like it's going to be dropping down to sort of five four degrees at night which isn't uncommon for april i mean we can still get frost up to the beginning of may so they will definitely be coming home with me but i'll take you through some of the varieties and i also brought a couple of little discounted plants as well so i'll take you through those i've also had a little look in the pond and it looks like the blanket weed is starting to take over ever so slightly now that we've got all of this sunlight so i want to go in there and give it a little bit of a tidy up but we have got to go careful because i've seen newty in there and there should be some tadpoles i mean they're have started to disappear i think he's been eating them all so yeah we'll give that a little bit of a tinker around but we do need to be quite careful and then we've also got some rhubarb that i really must pick for this weekend as well oh and i must show you some of the little seeds that we sowed last week i mean they're already starting to germinate not all of them but some of them so we've got plenty of jobs to keep us busy down here and as you know there will always be some other little bits and bobs along the way so i'm going to make a quick cup of coffee and then we better get started Oh, and whilst we're here, I do want to give a shout out to Anne, Phoebe's mum. Don't worry, I will be bringing in some rhubarb and making sure Phoebe brings it back for you. So keep your eyes out for that. Right, coffee, and then we can get started. So here we have got some of the seeds that we sowed just last weekend. Now in this one, we've got some chard. In here, we've got the lettuce, we've got the kale, and we've also got the cauliflower. Now I'll probably leave these in here overnight, but they will be ready to just take outside because it's probably gonna get a little bit too hot in here for them. And then down here, we have got some of the zinnias and they seem to be coming up brilliantly. So this one is all zinnias, but over here on this side, that is where we have got the straw flower and I don't think we've got anything germinating just yet as you know I've never really been able to grow them I've only really got them to the seedling stage so fingers crossed they will start to come on up there we've got the gourds nothing seems to be showing from them just yet these are the red currants and I want to pot them up into their own pots and possibly sell them down at the car boot because I do not need any more red currants. We'll probably give a few away as well. Now in here, this was the Coreopsis, but I did have a look at a few earlier and yeah, they've all rotted out. So I think we'll have a little bit of a tidy up in here and get rid of some of these gooseberries because they definitely haven't taken. Now you will know if they've taken because all of these little shoots here will start to open up similar to the red currants over there and they don't seem to have done that and they definitely should be out by now so we'll give them a little bit of a tidy up at the back here we've got a little fuchsia that is starting to show some green that is why i haven't got rid of that pot so fingers crossed that will turn into a nice big plant 
and then up here we've got some of the roses now this is something that i dug up out of the ground i'm not 100 percent sure on what it is but we thought we'd um pot it up and see what it turns into these are a couple of the climbing roses that i took cuttings from back in the autumn time and i've looked after them over the winter but yeah they're definitely ready to be potted up and then as we move down we've got some more gooseberries but again i don't think they've taken we can't see any of the leaves showing on them so we'll tidy those up the rosemary on the other hand they have definitely taken and they're ready to be potted up into their own little pots and then finally down here we have got some of the leeks and the peas but they don't seem to be showing themselves just yet now i have stuck them nearer the door because they don't like the heat as much as the other plants so fingers crossed over the next week or so they will start to sprout Right, so I think what we're going to do first of all is we're going to pot up some of these plants, the rosemary, the roses and also the currant bushes down there into their own little pots and then we can think about start sowing some more seeds out into the beds. Right, so I've got these guys out of the poly house. So here are the rosemary. I've had a little count up and we've got about 13, 14 of these plants that seem to have taken. Now you'll know that they've taken because they'll be growing fresh new growth on them. And yeah, they're looking really quite healthy in here. We'll check the root systems in just a moment. Then we've also got three of the rose cuttings that we took so this is golden showers i still can't get over that name it's a bright yellow uh, flower and i have been told that they're really fragrant now i've got the main plant over in the new seating nature area that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks can't wait for that to come out into bloom and then here we have got about 12 of the red currants and as i say i've got red currants dotted around all over this plot so these will either be given away or i'll try and make a couple of quid down at the car boot we'll see what we get up to but yeah we're going to pot all of these up so i've gone for some smaller pots for the rosemaries because they're quite small plants you don't want to put them in a really big pot because you've got a higher chance of them starting to rot out so we've gone for some of the diddly ones so we'll fill those up with some compost in just a moment and then with these guys i've gone for exactly the same size pot but they're going to have a pot and fresh compost all to themselves so they should start to take on quite nicely because they're going to have fresh nutrients and a lot more room to start spreading all of their roots so we'll get those potted up in a second as well and the same with the roses uh, i'm going to pop them into the same sort of size size pot now when we're potting these up we want to be making sure that we are potting them to the same level you don't want to go any deeper than what they already are some plants such as the brassicas which we'll get to a little bit later they can be buried a bit deeper same with your tomatoes but these guys we will bury them at the same depth so i'm just going to fill all of these pots up with a bit of fresh compost and then we can start teasing them out and potting them into their own little pots and like we did with the seeds, uh, give it a nice little firm down just to make sure that those roots have got a nice bed to anchor their roots in. And it will help you when it comes to transplanting these plants again or when it comes to planting them out because that root ball will stay nice and together. And somebody did put a little tip in the comments below. And when you're thinking about repotting them or getting them out into the ground, just don't give them a water for a couple of days beforehand and it will make it a lot easier when it comes to pulling the plants and the root ball out of the pots. Now one thing that I did forget to add to the compost beforehand which definitely helps is some perlite. So that helps aerate the soil, it helps with drainage but it also helps the soil to retain some of that moisture as well. So I am just going to put a little sprinkle in into each of these, give it a bit of a shake and then that should evenly distribute around the soil. Now, when I was mixing the compost and getting rid of all the big old lumps, I should have really sprinkled some of this in, but never mind, these things happen. So we'll just give it a little sprinkling in to this at the bottom, give it a bit of a shake up, and that should be absolutely fine. I'll just add this to the compost mix in a moment. Especially when it comes to your Mediterranean herbs, such as thyme, rosemary they really do like a nice free draining soil they don't like it to be too soggy and wet so in there you can see we've got the compost and also that perlite so we'll just give it a good old mix around just to make sure that all that perlite is mixed around in that soil Feel like a cocktail maker and we'll just give it another firm down
So I believe perlite is a type of volcanic rock. So what that means, it's got loads of little air pockets inside and it's not heavy like a normal rock. It's quite light, almost like polystyrene. And all of those little holes in the rock will hold onto the water, but also allows some drainage as well. Right, so there we go. You can see in there we've got the compost and the perlite. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to empty the rest of this bag of perlite in with the rest of the compost so I haven't got to worry about doing that every time. And I must get a new bag because this is nearly empty. So you want that sort of mix. So probably about a quarter to 20% perlite and then the rest compost. And that will make sure that it's nice and aerated and it's going to hold on to that moisture but also allow some oxygen in that soil as well, which will definitely help with the root formation. So next, let's tease out some of these rosemaries and get them planted up into their individual pots. Don't want to waste any of this compost. It's not exactly cheap nowadays, is it? So we'll start with this little pot down here. Now, as you can see, all of these new shoots of fresh growth from the original cuttings that we took probably back in October time, maybe even September. And I did use a little bit of rooting powder just to make sure that they did root into here and they seem to be doing really well. Now what we'll do is we'll just ease this out very gently and then we're just going to pull apart each individual plant. Now you want to be really careful with the roots on here. I'm hoping that they're going to have a nice root system but you won't know until you get them out of the pot. So let's give that a go now. There we go. Whoa, look at that. So you can see on here, we have got a really healthy root system on all of these. Now we do want to be really careful when we prise these apart. I say pull apart, you really want to tease them and be as gentle as possible to keep as much of that root system on the plant as possible. So we'll do that now. It might help if you've got a chopstick or some sort of uh, little sort of pea stick just to help tease them apart from one another so yeah let's give it a go so there we go you can see all of those roots on there and we're just going to pop that into its own little plant pot and we don't want to go any higher than where it already was and we'll just pop him in this is when you get a bit of compost hold it at the height that you want it to be at and then we'll just sprinkle some of this on top. And I'll try and get it into the center before we've done it at the sides because that helps with the root growth. Oh, we've got a little wormy in here. We'll get rid of him. You just want to firm that right down all around those roots. Don't be too hard. Don't want to damage them. There we have it, our first little rosemary plant. Now this, these have already started to flower. You now you can pinch them off so that it doesn't put the energy into the flowering and puts it back into the root ball. So we'll do that probably at the end and then we'll give these all a really good watering in and then I'm going to pop these back into the poly house just because it's a little bit warmer and it should get those roots going as well. Actually what I'm going to do with these guys is I'm going to go and get a tray uh, of water so no holes in the bottom and I'm just going to give these a little bit of a water bath and that will just allow them to soak up the water from the bottom rather than the top and that means that they can start getting some water straight away rather than sitting here in some dry soil for a little while. So I'm gonna go and do that now. So really, you want to be trying to keep as much of that root ball on here as possible, like I've done with this one. You might wanna shake off just a little bit of the old compost just so that you can get some fresh in there. And that should definitely help these little plants but just look at that root system on that that's a really healthy plant there 
And the great thing about these rosemary plants is that these will last hopefully for quite a few years. As long as you look after them properly, they do like the heat and they do like good drainage. So if you are planting them out in the garden and you've got really heavy clay soil, you might want to add some horticultural grit just to help aid the, the drainage. But other than that, these are great little plants and especially now that our summers are getting a lot warmer, they seem to do a lot better. I have had a few die over the winters in the past, but I think they've just been in little frost pockets. So do put, put them in a really nice sunny sheltered area. Look at that one. It's another really good healthy root system on there. And then as these start to get a little bit bigger, I'll need to pop them up again into some bigger pots. But for the time being, they should be okay in here. I'll just keep an eye on them. I'll probably give them a couple of months and then I'll check the root system on a couple of them. And if they start to look a little bit overcrowded and a little bit pot bound, we can then start potting, potting them up into a bigger pot. Got all the birds singing to me this morning. Got a little robin. I've had the blackbird and I've even heard the song thrush. One bird that I haven't heard for a couple of years down here is the cuckoo. We used to have a cuckoo and it's probably about this time of year that you used to hear it. I think a lot of people used to say that you don't plant out your potatoes until you start hearing the cuckoo. But yeah, it's been a while. I don't know how well the little cuckoo's doing nowadays. Right, so there we go. That was one of the little pots done and now we've just got one more to do. Again, we've got some beautiful roots on there. So we'll just do exactly the same with these and get them into their individual pots. This has got some water in but yeah we've done all of the rosemary plants so we'll let them soak in their little water bath just down on the floor whilst we do the red currants and the roses we're now going to move on to the three roses that we've got here so we're going to do exactly the same and just prize them out and be really delicate with these just so that we don't damage the roots so we'll just fill a couple of these up probably about a quarter of the way and then we'll prize them out now I find this is the most exciting bit when we take the plants out of the pot and we get to see that root system. I mean, like I say, we've got some beautiful new shoots forming up here. So that does show that they have taken root, but yeah, it's always a surprise to see how good the root system is. So let's get these little guys out. Now we haven't got as much of a root system as the rosemary, but they were probably getting a little bit too pot bound in there anyway. But if we look on the bottom, we can see that we've got loads of beautiful little roots starting to form. So these should be great. So we're just gonna prise these apart again, being extra careful with the little root ball at the bottom, trying to keep the roots which belong to each of the plants together. And then we will pop these into their own pots. Now this one, it's fallen apart quite a bit. Now this is what's really important to make sure that that soil is really compact when you've got it inside that pot because otherwise all of this happens. But we'll give it a go anyway. So we'll just pop him down in here. And then we'll bury it at the same depth of what it was. Go careful because these have got big old thorns on them. You can give it a little bit of a tap to make sure that that soil's got all around those roots, but when we do give it a water anyway, that will help settle it as well. Now don't worry too much if it's not in the centre. It doesn't really matter as long as it's got plenty of room 
for those roots to explore all that new soil with all those new nutrients. So there we go, that's the first rows. Now we just need to separate these two. So just, there we go. As you can see, again, a really nice root system on there. You can see more just on that side. So these should do quite well in their new pots. So there we go, we've got one, two, three roses all potted up into their own. So I'm going to give these a proper water from the top. I'm not going to pop these into a water bath and then we will leave these. I'm probably going to leave these outside now because that poly house is getting a little bit warm, especially when the sun is on it in full beam. It's getting up to sort of about 30 degrees, which is a little bit too warm for a rose. So yeah, we will find a little spot to put these somewhere sheltered and we'll give these a good water in just a moment. Now we just need to move on to the red currants. I've seen a big old spider running around in this pot, so I want to get rid of him before I start dipping my hands in there. Oh, there we go. Right, no. Oh. All right, you gone? It's gone. I mean, I'm not terrified of spiders. Oh, I just don't like them crawling on me. <laughs> right. So yes, now we're on to the red currants and just like we've done with the roses, we're just gonna pop these out, check out the root system and pop them into their own little pots. Just be careful of the roots. So I'm not gonna take you through all of this step by step. I'm just gonna crack on with it. So I'll see you once I've done all 12 of these. But I will just show you the roots on these. Again, really nice little root system going on. And these are just cuttings that I took back in the autumn time so they're really quick to root i do think i used some root and powder on this just to help i know the roses as i didn't because roses just seem to take regardless but yeah if you've got some root and powder it definitely helps bring them along now to be honest i don't think these really need the perlite so i don't want to waste the perlite on these so i'm just going to get a new tub of compost on its own and i'm going to use that to fill the pots up instead because that gritty mix was much better for seedlings and when you're first starting your cuttings whereas i think these red currants will be happy in just standard compost go they are all of the red currants so we've got 14 in total and hopefully these will all start to grow some really healthy root systems on them i'll give them a really good water along with the roses and then next we've got to do the melons so i'll go and grab those from my car so these scraggly looking plants these are my melons they're called amir they're an f1 variety and they're just getting a little bit too big for these uh, cell trays now and they're already putting out their tendrils which show to me that they're ready to support themselves and they need a little bit more feed than what they've probably got in here now with some of these trays i've just sown one seed a couple of them i've got two so i will try and prize them apart and where i can't i will be picking the stronger of the plant because i don't think i need 10 melons now i've never been able to grow melons before i've always got them to this sort of stage but then they've rotted off down at the stem in the pot so i really want to make sure that that doesn't happen this time and i'll definitely be taking these home with me because we're looking at temperatures of down to five degrees and that's a little bit too cold for these guys they do like it to be quite warm so i'm just going to find some pots and then we'll have a little look at the root system on these and then we're going to pop these into some compost with some of the perlite give them a water and then we'll take them home with us. Now, if you have been able to grow melons in the past, please let me know in the comments below on any tips that you've got. Like I said, every single year I try the melons 
and they never form. I know that there's a certain way that you prune them and train them later on in the season, but for now, we'll see how we get on. Now I've gone for some fairly wide pots here and I filled them up about one third of the way with some of the compost, um, but they're not too deep. And what I must remember is these really do not like to be planted any deeper. Now I said that about the others, but you can sort of go a few centimetres, but I don't want this to rot away at the stem because that is what, hap what has happened time and time again. So we'll pull these little guys out and we'll check on the root system. Here's our first little plant here. And as you can see, we've got some really nice roots on there starting to form and it's not too pot bound at the moment, but as you can see, it's getting quite long now. So it's definitely ready for its own little pot. So we're gonna pop this into one of these and then we'll give it a good water and hopefully find some little pea sticks just to help it start supporting itself in the pot. Now with these, I'm definitely gonna be watering them from the bottom just to avoid that stem from getting wet. Because as I say, I have had these rot off on me in the past. So there we go. That's the first little guy potted up. We'll go and find some pea sticks for him in just a moment. And we'll try and do a few more in here. Got two in this one, so I really want to go careful. Whenever you're potting up your seedlings, you really want to be going for the most healthiest plants where possible. Now these are all quite healthy. I have got a few that are quite sort of leggy and I don't think they're going to do too well. So I'll probably get rid of those ones and just leave me with one, two, three, probably about six plants in total. We have now got seven melon plants. Now I'm just going to give these a water from the bottom and I just want to try and find some pea sticks just to help support these ever so slightly because I do think that could be the problem as to why they were rotting off. They're flapping around a little bit too much which has weakened that stem down at the bottom and I don't want that to happen this time. So we'll have a little look around and see what we can use just to help support these little plants. I forgot I had these. These are just some bamboo skewers that you use for a barbecue. You can buy proper pea sticks, but I think they're a little bit more expensive than these. Just go careful, they're quite sharp. But I'm just going to put three in each pot and I'm going to make a little teepee type frame and just wrap them around. And hopefully that should give them enough support until sort of the middle of May, June, when we can start planting them out into the poly house properly. So yeah, we'll just get these all supported up now and then give them their final water. There we go. So I'm just going to do the same for all of the others. So they've got a nice little support to start growing up before we start popping them out into their forever homes. There we go, guys. That is all the rosemaries, the roses. We've got the red currants and also the melons all potted up into their own pot. So now I'll take you through some of the little plants that I got yesterday down at the garden centre. So first up, we're going to go through some of the chili plants that I've bought. But before we start, I must say you've got much more varieties if you grow them from seed to begin with. There are hundreds of types of chilies that you can pick from, whereas in the garden centres, you're quite limited. I mean, there's probably about seven or eight different types in the garden centre compared to the hundreds that you can get from seed. But I just do not have the space at home to grow them. But if you did grow them from seed, you'd probably want to start them in February, especially if you've got some grow lights, where Whereas if you're growing them on a hot windowsill, you'd probably want to start middle of March, end of March, just as those light levels are starting to increase because they do like the heat and they do like quite a bit of sun. Just remember to turn your plants around so that they don't become too leggy and so that they don't grow towards the sunlight. 
Another thing that you want to do when they start to get this tool is you can pinch out the growing tip at the top. Now this isn't going to damage the plant, it's just going to help that become a little bit more bushy and you'll find that where the leaves come off from the stem, you'll start to get new shoots forming and that will make it a lot more bushier and you'll hopefully get more flowers and that means more fruit. So this variety here is called Hot Banana and it will give fruit probably about three, four inches long. There'll be this yellow color. They'll probably start off green and you'll know they're ready as soon as they start to change yellow. But I've tried these before and they are quite hot. They're great for sort of curries, um, a chili con carne, anything where you want a little bit of spice in them. But I did have to hunt around for some decent plants because they hadn't had a huge amount of light, but they do look like they need a little bit of a water. So I'm gonna pop them in the poly house just for today. And then tomorrow I'm gonna take them home because it is gonna get quite nippy and they don't like anything sort of below seven or five degrees. So yeah, that is one type of chili that we've got. And then we've got two more varieties down here. So next up, we have got the Scotch Bonnet. Now these produce quite small fruits. They're probably, what, two inches, but they're a lot more rounder. And they've got all of these crevices. And I believe that actually makes them hotter because inside it's the sort of white bit, not the flesh itself that produces the heat. And with all of those crevices, it's got a lot more surface area. Now Scotch Bonnet, I believe it's used quite a lot in Jamaican food and used for jerk. And I love that sort of food. It's absolutely beautiful. So yeah, we definitely get quite a few of these on the plant last year anyway and they'll start to turn sort of a ready orange color once they're ready to be picked but the the plant itself will probably get to about a foot maybe two foot tall and again pinch out the top so that you can get this really bushy and then finally we have got a cayenne pepper so cayenne peppers i don't think they're quite as hot as a scotch bonnet and you'll get these beautiful orange type peppers on them and again they'll probably be about two inches in length and these are great dried and you can use these in loads of different recipes and with all of my chilies they will be kept in the poly house because it gets really hot in there and they do like the heat and because they're quite small they won't rot off what i do find is with some of my bell peppers the quite large ones it just gets too hot in my poly house and they do start to rot so yeah these will be absolutely fine because they're only small little fruits that you get on them now this is a patio variety so it's not going to get too huge the plant itself but hopefully it will still give one hell of a yield so they are the three chili plants that i'm going to be growing this year as i say it's only me that eat them so i don't need a huge amount of plants next up we'll have a look at some of the sweet peppers that i've bought so here we have got balcony now i believe that's just because it's going to be quite a small plant again so you could grow it on your balcony in a pot and these look very similar to the cayenne peppers so they're not huge peppers and i wanted to go for a smaller variety because i do find some of the really large bell peppers they either don't form uh, quick enough and they don't ripen quick enough whereas these smaller ones should hopefully ripen quite quick and we should get quite a few on the plant itself now I did buy two of each, so I might try one in the poly house and see how they get on because they are a little bit smaller than the normal bell peppers that I would grow. And then we'll try one outside and see how they fare. And then next year, we, depending on which ones do best, we'll know where to plant these in the future. Now these are sweet peppers, so they're not as hot as the other ones, but they will look quite similar. So I must label them up so that I know which is which. Last thing you want is a chili pepper in a nice salad. Next up, we have got Thor, which is a little bit larger so these should hopefully get to about four five inches long the actual fruit themselves um, and these will definitely be going outside because the bigger the pepper the more chance they are to rot off in the poly house now with a lot of these peppers we probably won't be getting any sort of fruit until the end of july maybe august time but you'll get loads of flowers on these every year i do do quite well with the peppers and then finally we have got a snack pepper. So that just means that it's gonna be quite a small little pepper, perfect to fit inside a lunchbox. And again, a very sweet one. These are red, so they'll start off green. They'll start to turn a sort of orangey color and then you'll know they're ready as soon as they turn this vibrant red color. Do go careful of the slugs because if a slug gets hold of one of these, you will find that they will make their way through the peppers. The amount of peppers I've had in the past where it looks beautiful, I turn it around, there's a massive hole in there and there's slugs and snails inside and it just becomes inedible. So do watch out for the slugs and the snails when it comes to your pepper plants.
Next up, we have got a tomato. So this is called Sweet Million. It's a cherry. You get loads of diddly little sweet tomatoes on here. They're absolutely beautiful. I did grow these last year as well. Now these will be going into the poly house because they do like the heat. And not only that, if there is blight in the air and it gets the tomatoes, which I've got outside, it normally gives them another two, three weeks before it starts to enter inside the poly house. It just acts as a little bit of a barrier to make sure that you've definitely got some tomatoes in the season. These are beautiful in salads, but I also like to grill them as well with some mushrooms, maybe with a steak and some chips, something like that. But yeah, I do like a cherry tomato compared to some of the beef tomatoes. I just find that they've got a lot more sweeter flavour, whereas the beef tomatoes, they can just be a little bit too watery. So yeah, we've got two of these, and then we've also got some cucumbers as well. This here, this is called Hanna. It's an F1 variety. So F1s, they are bred and you cannot save the seed. Well, you could and try and grow them, but they're probably not going to turn into anything like you've had the year before. So I wouldn't bother trying to save the seed of any of your F1 varieties, but these are mini cucumbers. I find that they do much better than some of the longer, such as the Telegraph, and you get a much bigger yield because you get tons and tons of tiny little cucumbers, which are perfect for a lunchbox and great for a salad as well. So I've got two of these, and then we've got one more variety as well. So here we have got Tiny Tot, it is a patio variety, so you can pop these into a pot and they'll do absolutely fine. These will all be going into the poly house because they do like the heat, but yeah, this one should be a good one. I've never grown this one before, but looking at the photo, it should have quite a good yield on it as well. I think last year I grew, was it Gold Lemon Apple, which are the round uh, yellow cucumbers, which I absolutely loved, but all the family kept turning their noses up at them because to them, a cucumber should be green and long. So I haven't bothered growing any of them this year. I've just stuck to the normal standard cucumbers just to make sure that they definitely get eaten and I'm not inundated with cucumbers. So I'm gonna give all of these a little water and then I'm gonna pop them in the poly house tonight and then I'll take them home with me tomorrow because it is meant to get a little bit chilly and all of these plants really do like the heat and if they get even the slightest bit of cold that could knock them back and affect your yield later on in the year. So when I was having a look at the chilies and bits and pieces I had to visit the clearance section. You cannot go to a garden centre without having a look at some of the sale items because it's great to come home with a bargain or two. Now this is an ericium also known as a perennial wallflower. And if you remember a few months back, I took some cuttings from my nans and they came on really well, but I think somewhere in the winter, the frost got through to the roots and they did die off. So I haven't got any more of those, which is why I've picked these up. And the great thing about these plants is that they will flower from probably what, February time all the way through to November. So the pollinators have got a really good source of nectar throughout the year. And they produce these really tall, uh, flower spikes they can reach up to sort of 30 centimeters and they have dainty little flowers just like a wallflower and they start off as this really vibrant pinky purple and as they begin to fade they sort of turn into this lavender color and yeah I absolutely adore these I had this one of these when I first got my plot and um they do really, really well, no matter where you put them. Full sun, a little bit of shade, but I'm gonna be sticking these down in the nature area, seating area that we've been working on for the last few weekends. And uh, we've got two of these, I'll space them out and we'll go and find a spot for them in just a moment. And then whilst I was in the clearance section, I did pick up one more little plant as well. Here we've just got a little lavender plant, so nothing special at all, but this was the only one that hadn't gone into full flower. The others looked like they were going over and the bees absolutely love them. So I thought this was the perfect time to get one of these. I can't believe this was half price as well, but this will like full sun and good drainage, a bit like a Mediterranean herb, and the smell on these are beautiful. You can use them at home for soaps, candles, that sort of stuff, or even if you just put it in the bath or something like that. So we'll find a little spot for this. I'm not too sure where just yet, because as I say, I want somewhere where it's gonna be in full sun, and then the bees are really going to enjoy this. So come on, let's go and find a couple of spots in the nature area for the Arisium, and then I'll have a little think about where we're gonna pop this as well. So I'm running out of a little bit of space down here. I thought I had a little bit more space than what I thought. So let's just pop this one here. And then I'm thinking this one will probably go into that space there. 
Now these do grow quite big, so I'm thinking I don't want it to be blocking out any of the light for the other plants, but I don't think I've got anywhere else to really put them at the moment. Actually, I have got a little spot just down here next to the pear tree. I think that could fill that space quite nicely down there. So we've got one over there and we've got another one just down there. So I think that'll be good. Right, let me go and grab a fork and then we can dig a couple of holes. Right, so we need to get in here and give this a little bit of a tidy up. I wouldn't recommend giving it a big old clean this time of year because you've got all sorts of animals in there. You've got the frogs, you've got the newts, you should have some tadpoles, baby newts. We've even got the dragonfly and mayfly larvae in there, the water boatman. All of this pond is going to be alive. So we do need to go really careful when we start pulling out some of this blanket weed. Now you will find at this time of year the blanket weed will start to take over quite a bit and that's just because the water is starting to warm up and the light levels are starting to increase as well. Now I'm hoping that once I've got the majority of this out all the oxygenators in there should start to take over and we shouldn't have much of a problem with the blanket weed. You will probably need to give it a clean out every now and then but honestly it should start to look after itself from now on. Now we've got a flag iris and that really doesn't like those rhizomes to be covered up with all the blanket weed and the dead foliage as well. So try and remove as much of that as possible because you want the sun to start baking them so that you get lots of blooms and they really start to take off. Not only that, but you've also got the water lily and that also needs some light in there so that you get some beautiful blooms and it won't be too long before that really does start to take over in here. I'm hoping once I've removed some of this blanket weed, it's going to allow a lot more space for the insects in the pond to really start moving around, especially the water boatmen, because it's, they really can't get around with all of that blanket weed. So I'm just going to comb my fingers through and just pull out as much as possible, trying not to uproot some of the other plants that we've got in there, especially the stuff that looks like a mare's tail, because that is great. That really does help oxygenate the water. So we'll just go round, give it a bit of a tidy up, and then hopefully at the end, we'll be able to see a little bit more life going on inside the pond. You see little Newtie just underneath there? Now I've seen two in here since I've been having a bit of a clean out. So I'm hoping we've got mummy and daddy. Oh, there we go. There's two of them just there. I can't say I've seen one of him before. Oh. Is that a crested noob? I'll have to get my identification book out and have a little look. But he's all spotty. So I've probably just spent the last half an hour or so watching all the wildlife in that pond after giving it a good old clean out. I reckon we've got at least eight different newts in there. A couple of males, most of them seem to be females, and I have done a little bit of research and that was a male smooth newt. It isn't a crested newt, I'm afraid, but still, they're absolutely amazing creatures. Now that is probably why I've got no tadpoles in there because they've all been having a good old munch, but I'm not too bothered because I have got two other ponds which I know that the frogs absolutely love so that's absolutely fine but this pond is definitely coming alive I mean I was seeing all the little larvae in there for the mayflies and the dragonflies and it won't be too long before you see them start crawling up the irises and some of the ferns that I've got and you'll see them break free out of their little skeleton and their wings come out honestly it's amazing if I can get that on film I certainly will but I could spend hours sitting here by the pond having a little watch because there is so much going on in there 
So do stay tuned if you do like ponds, pond life, everything that goes on in them because it is just amazing. And if you haven't got one, I really would recommend it. You haven't got to go for a big one like this. Even just a little washing up bowl will bring all sorts of different wildlife into your garden. So I'm probably just going to sit here for another five minutes and then we'll harvest some rhubarb and then it'll probably be time to go home. I really need to give some of this rhubarb a real good harvest. Now, I did harvest quite a lot from down there, which I took into work with me. Um, but as you can see down here, it's a little bit crowded. And if you want your stems to turn that beautiful blush ready pink, then you really need the sunlight to be getting to them. Otherwise, they end up green. Still tastes beautiful, still can eat it. But if you're making something like rhubarb jam or you really need that colour, you want the sunlight to be getting to it. So yes, I'm just going to come down here and give this a harvest. Now, when you're harvesting, your rhubarb you don't want to snap it off you need to pull it so that it comes off in one so there we go you can see you'll get a little end like that now if you snap it the chances are that the crown will start to rot over a period of time so get your hand right at the base of the plant give it a little wiggle and pull and you should end up with a stick and the end will look a little bit like celery i've got quite a lot down here that we need to harvest and this I'll take home and we'll probably have it stewed with either a crumble or it is quite nice just on its own. You do need a fair amount of sugar with it because it can be quite tart. But the more you pick it, the more you're going to get back. Now this is quite an early variety. Some people, it's only now starting to show itself. Now, these were already here, so I'm not 100% on the variety, but it is probably uh, temperly early, temperly early, because of how early it does start to grow. And we'll probably be picking this well into July. But after July, you really need to give it a little bit of time for it to put all of its energy back into that crown so that you keep getting loads of rhubarb year after year. Now, they are perennial like your asparagus. So if you do look after your crowns properly, you can have these for up to 20 years. I'm not too sure how long these have been here. And also as they get bigger and bigger, you can divide the crowns. But if you do divide them, don't pick um, off the new crown for the first year or maybe two years. And the likeliness is that it probably will flower. So don't forget to snap those flower heads off. Now I'm only going to take enough for us at home but you'll be surprised how much this stuff cooks down so you do need a fair amount of it like I said at the beginning and don't you worry I'll make sure Phoebe is in the office when I next bring a big old batch in to work for everyone now when you're picking your rhubarb you want to go for the biggest longest stalks first of all and you don't want to pick the crown completely clean. You want to leave a few leaves on there to make sure that it's producing energy through that photosynthesis to keep creating more and more stalks for you. So we'll just thin this out until we think that's enough. The other thing is, is when you let it get this big, you will find that you end up with lots of spindly bits of rhubarb rather than the big old chunky bits that I get right at the beginning of the year but that's not a problem it all tastes the same and you might find that some of them have started to die under there especially with you know the amount of shade that it's been getting but just pick them up to avoid any of the slugs and I do find that the shield beetles absolutely love the rhubarb and don't worry about them they're not going to cause any harm to your plants if you do find them Oh, and the other thing is, just in case you don't know much about rhubarb, don't eat the leaves. They are poisonous. I do put them on the compost. They rot down. They don't make the compost poisonous. But if you were to cook them up and eat them, there's some form of chemical in here which wouldn't do you any good at all. So yeah, make sure you chop them off before you cook any of your rhubarb. Now, rhubarb does like a good water. I mean, we've had plenty of water over the last few months, so these should be okay for now. But in the height of summer, you do want to make sure that you're getting in here and giving them a good old water in buckets. I mean, I probably use about 
50 gallons on all of these plants down here. Mind you, I have got quite a few crowns. And that's the sort of ready colour that you, you want for your jams and bits and pieces like that. But it can start to go a little bit greener. You can still see that purple, that pinky fleck in there, but just as goes a little bit green. So there we go, that is our little harvest from today and I say little because I can normally pick about three or four times this amount every about three weeks. Um, so yeah, we'll take this home, probably give some of this to some of the plot neighbours as well. Let me just pop this down there. That is all we've got time for today folks. Now we didn't get round to direct sowing some of these seeds into the bed so that's things like spring onions, beetroot, carrot but I am going to be back down here tomorrow anyway and I must remember to bring my asparagus crowns because I want to plant those up and I'll give you some tips when it comes to planting them and growing them and yeah that is one job I really must get done. Oh, and we must build the brassica cage. That's another job we need to get ticked off the list. But yeah, I will be back down here tomorrow with another little adventure down here on the plot. So I hope you have a lovely evening, guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. So take care. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>